I really love that subject. Let's move on and let's talk about the other core features. Let's start with advertising and promotion. So we've got the seller dashboard here and I'm selling stuff on Amazon or some marketplace. Could I, within my storefront, the marketplace dictating this, right? The marketplace may be the one doing all the advertising and promotion. And, you know, sometimes you can say, uh, you know, in the games on your phone, remove ads, pay $3 a month, something like that, right? So you may get your seller storefront for free as long as the marketplace owner can advertise in your space and promote your competitors. Or some marketplaces like our platform allows this to control and potentially sell ad space within their store, whether it be to promote uh, brands or other marketplaces or whether you're cross promoting other friends that have stores as well. So why don't you talk a little bit, Chris, about the technicality of advertising and promotions within the seller dashboard? Absolutely. Thanks, Ron. So this is pretty interesting because one of the big powerful things about adding and selling is having a feedback loop with analytics and being able to do sort of several things with the analytics. Number one, be able to present a compelling business case to your sellers, to your vendors with your essentially data as a service and really allowing them to have a platform to reach an audience. And fundamentally, if you think about it, from a business perspective, this is probably one of the number one, what's in it for me, you know, channels that businesses are tuning into all the time. How can I reach my audience? How can I reach my customers? And how can I reach them in an economically uh, viable way uh, where we can even scale up into that? And that's exactly what you're going to be able to present to them should you play your cards right with enabling the right marketplace with the right advertising and promotion capability. So you really want to be able to present from just a sort of general perspective what kind of traffic they would be able to tap into and some statistics around that traffic. Uh, this can be different aspects of your users and what their sort of typical behavior is on your site. Um, how much revenue was processed in each of the key categories on your platform? Uh, what kind of traffic and how long do people usually go through, um, you know, advertise? What kind of product level, um, you know, purchasing do you see? Uh, these kind of things. And we can, you know, we can present more, you know, typical advertising um, statistics within the dashboard. But the idea is that we want to present the data. Um, and the fact that you have built into your marketplace data as a service, whether you advertise and sell the data itself, uh, doesn't really matter in this sense, because we want to sort of say to the vendor, to the seller, look, we have this incredible set of validation about how successful your ads can be. Um, you really should consider if you're not doing it, uh, turning advertising on uh, within the platform setting up promotion for your items, that kind of a thing. Okay, so that's that. And then whenever you're going through advertising and promotions, it is actually quite challenging typically for sellers to learn different advertising depending on how complex it is. Ultimately, the main thing is that we want to make it simple and we want to make it something after sort of setting this hook of, look, there's this opportunity within this marketplace for you to tap into a set of very focused traffic for users that are looking right now for your items. Um, so sort of once we set that hook, we want them to be able to easily turn on ads. And really, this boils down to sort of having an opinionated process that they go through whenever they set their ads up. Uh, typically, this is going to mean having some templates having uh, specific steps that you require, but give them instructions that are built into the user interface and essentially remove anything that's not necessary during the initial setup so that it's just what's necessary. It's very opinionated. And then they can always go back and tweak and fine tune things um, and have the opportunity to sort of, you know, keep iteratively refining and tuning everything as they get results. Yeah, I agree the with other that. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. 
Oh, uh, no, feel free if you want in. Yeah, I was going to say the other thing too is uh, in the templates that you use, and I know sometimes if you, like back in the days when we were advertising in the yellow papers in the skyscrapers versus horizontal versus quarter page, eighth page, half page, we're all different, right? So if we're going to have this template, is there an administrative engine that allows them to control and ensure that they're uploading the right graphics? Uh, have a what is the cost per ad? What is the monetization? How do I report on that? So anyway, go ahead. And, you know, the big thing here is that we want the user to see that there's more information available and there's more fidelity that they can get into, um, but it's not where they set things up. And in fact, you know, in many cases, Ron, it makes a lot of sense to even have such an opinion that we're just giving them a formula, uh, depending on what their goals are that they can implement a template that sort of adheres to a formula. Like an example would be, I want to generate leads from a simple form. I want to provide people with a fun load of some kind of value add for this, uh, this specific niche offer. Uh, for example, maybe it's a calculator. Maybe it's a white paper with best practices that you want to give them. Um, sometimes uh, different vendors want to get newsletters uh, subscriptions. In many cases, depending on the dollar amount, the cost of the item, that may be the best way to get some kind of transactional interaction to occur, saying that they purchase a very expensive item or cumbersome to you know fulfill, et cetera. Um, of course, the other end of the spectrum could be, um, you know, I want them to purchase these items, and maybe it's even I want to put an offer out there that shows them a bulk discount if they purchase a lot of the items. Uh, that could be the other end of the spectrum. The point is that we want them to have a really turnkey experience with not uh, with not getting stuck in the weeds around the logistical aspects of this. Now, once we're sort of there, uh, then the other big thing with advertising and promotions is to report back to them on the results, as well as making it easy for them to progress through their journey. Things that you'll see if you sort of do research into advertising is it probably somewhere north of 80 to 90 percent of all advertising literally all of the sort of number of advertisers probably not all advertising by volume but the number of advertisers like 85 to 90 percent of the advertisers who do any kind of advertising do not track the analytics and reporting because it's too complex there's yeah. just too much information it's overwhelming they have all the intention in the world of doing it, but they just don't get results and then they don't figure it out and then they just think it doesn't work. That's just the reality for most advertising. If you talk to anyone in the space, um, again, volume, I think by volume, you know, the folks that are successful uh, represent a majority of the volume that's being, you know, invested into advertising. Uh, so they're going to be more sophisticated. But what you want to take from this as a marketplace updater is that you have an opportunity here to provide a disproportionate value to your users by, again, being very opinionated and keeping it simple. Pick two or three key metrics that your sellers are going to care about. And a very common thing is going to be you know, something as simple as what are the impressions, what's the bounce rate, and then what are the conversions? And if those three pieces of data and then recommendations for best practices from you about what's working in your marketplace that is essentially sanitized, but we've got real data from an aggregation of what's working that we can present to us, then we can sort of say, look, if you just change these three things and and modify these sort of three focus areas in this way that is working, uh, your odds will dramatically improve. And the key to the game here is to sort of provide them with, um, you know, a drip campaign via transactional email, uh, some form of, um, you know, one of the biggest things that I like to see whenever, uh, you know, I'm, I'm working with business, business owners uh, or, you know, sellers, marketers, IT folks that are busy is giving them an opinionated template that sort of like, I want to improve my bounce rate. Here's a checklist or a guide for, based on what we're seeing in our marketplace. So those kind of things can be dramatically impactful in a positive way for your sellers 
uh, the final hit on here is just talking about the end user. Now, this is really important because ultimately that's what from a just pure mechanics perspective, you want to kind of always have this integrity and focus on regardless of what's happening. It, and being in a position where you're saying, look, gosh, you know, I want to make sure that the end user is suddenly getting the best result. So this feedback loop needs to apply to them as well. And ultimately, what we want to do there is say, um, you know, number one, the performance of the different ads and promotions needs to be part of the decision making in the algorithm for your site as to what's shown. And specifically, what the sort of dwell time and conversion rate and even ratings where someone reviews an ad or gives feedback appropriate um, or it doesn't match what they were looking for. Uh, typically best to determine this with analytics and behaviorals, um, but also by looking at, you know, direct feedback that folks provide, we want to then adjust and tune our results within the site. And we want to say, look, uh, here's the situation. Um, you know, this particular user uh, really, you know, in this niche, these ads from these three vendors, because they're really hitting the the mark, they're delivering the most value. And that should be dynamic and it should scale automatically with your platform? Does it have the ability to adjust to what the users are looking for with, you know, inline promotions, with uh, sidebars, banners, etc., and to automatically make that part of the equation? Um, of course, with most advertising, there's going to be a bidding model. Uh, but that bidding model, just like many of the platforms, Google is certainly a great example of this. Uh, they look at the quality of the content and quality of the ads and the relevance, and they give that as much or more of a weighting, uh, depending on the performance of the seller, the advertiser, uh, to make that match up to what the buyer, the user, is actually looking for. And that's a really key part of the integrity and credibility to have uh, with your platform offering. Thoughts on that, Ron? Feel free if you want to share uh, you know, any detail there as well. Yeah, absolutely. I really love about it as a feedback loop, right? Because you think this is ads, this is outbound, but as a feedback loop, how do you turn an outbound into a feedback loop? And I think the analytics is one way. But another way that I've seen that, um, I've seen people actually with the advertisements, and we've seen this for the last literally 25 years with uh, knowledge bases, right? You read a knowledge base article, uh, Ron, the guy used to be in IT, right? You read a knowledge base article and at the bottom, what does it say? Was this helpful plus up, thumb up, right? They're always trying to grade and get the feedback of did the article and the information answer the question properly. Well, you can use actually exit intent. So let's say, for example, I had an ad or a promotion on my product page and they clicked on that promotion and they went to that product. When they exit that product or if they were to bounce off that product, what would happen if I popped up an exit intent that says, hey, was this ad helpful or not? And we could get feedback immediately right then knowing if we're serving up the right things. Uh, maybe they're just busy and have to leave and they're going to bookmark it and they're going to leave the page open. Um, maybe they are going to bounce and it wasn't helpful. And I wouldn't you like to know that, right? So those are some of the kinds of things. And speaking of feedback, and again, this is kind of the indirect feedback based on the behavior and the analytics of things that have happened. A more in your face, very common that you want to see is ratings and reviews. I mean, if you want feedback on your product, you want feedback on your storefront, you want feedback on what you're doing, uh, nothing more in your face than ratings and reviews, right? And I don't know if you're like my wife, she lives and breathes by those things, right? She will not buy anything. She immediately goes, we just, buy, we just had to replace our washing machine. And she literally went in and we're always buying the best, right? We have to buy the best and they always end up down. So now what she does, and she's done this for the last 15 years, um, she went in and started deciding which ones she wanted, reading a lot of reviews about them, reading consumer reports. Then she goes to the exact model that she thinks she wants, goes to the reviews, make sure it has decent reviews. But what does she do? She goes straight to the one star reviews and reads every single one of them. And fortunately, you know, being very intelligent, she's like, oh, this one, they were mad because it shipped three days late. This one, they were mad because the installers, last night, 11 o'clock, my wife was complaining to me about our brand new washer that we literally just got a week ago. And I'm like, what's going on? And she says, there's too much steam. There's too much condensation. It just doesn't make. So I pull the washer out. I go, look, and guess what the guys did? They literally 
put the hot line to the cold to the hot and they had the line switch. So she's running all these cold washes and it's just steaming and condensating and she goes to pull the clothes out and they're all hot. And so I'm trying to adjust water at the wall, not assuming that, you know, the guys that install these things for a living can't connect literally two hoses, but they screwed it up and I had to fix them last night, right? So now do I go back and put a review and it's a one-star review? Well, that has nothing to do with the washing machine. So I don't go review the washing machine and put a review that's a one star and potentially sales for the seller of the washing machine when it's probably a third party company they outsourced for the installation, right? And ratings can be very important. I always feel like the reviews need to be attached with the ratings because I see so many people give a one star uh, or I'll read like four stars and it'll be like, this is the best restaurant I've ever been at. I'm like, then why'd you only give it four stars, right? So. I feel like the reviews have to be a part of the ratings um, because you need that context, right? Because a one star very well be a different a one star for somebody else, especially when it has to do with shipping, has nothing to do with the product, and I care more about the product, right? So I think rating and reviews is something that's very, very important. We need to make sure that we have that not only on the products, but now that we're talking about a marketplace, there's another tier of ratings here, right? Uh, I don't know about you if you've ever bought on eBay or anything like that, but I bought a lot of stuff on eBay. And one of the ratings that I used to look at, it's been a while since I've been on eBay, but um, it used to be, I would always try to make sure I'm only buying from the power sellers, right? I wanted to make sure that they were actually rated as a power seller. And I didn't even know what the metric, right? But I knew it was something that was hard because not very many people had that rating. And so whether they had to have, you know, above a four star, whether they had to have a minimum of 5,000 or 10,000 reviews, whatever it was, whatever they did to make a power seller, I knew it was a pretty big, heavy lift. And so I was always looking for seller reviews. So you've got the product reviews. And now in this marketplace, we've got this thing called seller reviews. So we want to be able to rate Ron and Chris selling their wares compared to the physical product, because there might be other vendors that sell that product too, but I'm more worried about the service that the vendor is going to supply to me after I buy that product, right? So for a marketplace, ratings and reviews can be two-tiered. So you want to be able to favorite stores. You want to be able to rate stores and sellers more than just the products. So dive in and give us your thoughts on ratings and reviews. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit with the context of AI and being able to leverage that as well, because... One of the things that you see whenever you, is you do get a lot of bots and scam uh, reviews where sellers will sort of have a different level of integrity with what they're willing to do to get their rankings up. So you've got to be able to handle that at scale automatically. Um, there are just really simple things that we can do there with looking at the IP address, being able to understand like getting databases of IP addresses and other behavioral analysis that show that, hey, this is a bot that's putting a fake review in for someone to boost their profile. Um, the other thing that's really helpful is just like you said, Ron, being able to sort of determine the sentiment of someone's review. Um, that can be really interesting, not just for the sake of the buyer getting that data. There's no reason that we can't take proactive measures to encourage and help a seller if they just got a negative review, a lot of times with different platforms, they don't even know about it. They do know about it. They don't necessarily know how to respond in that they could actually just address the issue that the buyer has and maybe give the buyer the opportunity to update the review. And the cool thing about reviews is if it creates this governance where it reinforces positive behavior, that's an even better set of data. We would all probably agree that companies are going to make mistakes. The real thing, how do they respond to those mistakes and what is their integrity level with their behavior after a mistake is called out? Obviously, you know, in the example you gave, Ron, with the washing machine and how it basically was hooked up to the wrong, uh, you know, uh, hot. That could have been something where a review was posted. I'll just say someone different than you that didn't have those skills to sort of confidence to look at that. They post a negative review. And then in a cordial and professional, um, the seller has a automated response from an AI that goes to them and says, hey, sometimes this can occur 
you know, we've seen this pattern where sometimes this kind of situation has nothing to do with the product. It's actually an issue with the connectivity of the washer and dryer. Do you want to use this standard response to respond that we recommend? Right. And then Deller could just use that that says, thank you so much for sharing your feedback. We always want to improve. Um, we want to make sure you have a great experience. Here are some links to potential areas that might be helpful. We're not saying it is the issue in this case, but it has occurred that it's been the hot water and cold water lines being mixed up. Um, we provide complimentary support as shown here. And we just want to really encourage you that we want to take care of you and do the right thing. Let us know if any of these options are scenarios you'd like to engage in. And then two days later, whenever they have that kind of negative review, and then they get feedback from the seller, and then they actually have a good experience, they're going to be glowing typically. Right. Um, they're going to come back and say, oh my gosh, these guys are the best. They had this incredible support person named Ron. He is my favorite person now. Um, he made my holidays and, you know, he fixed this right before blah, blah, blah was happening. And I'm sorry, I left a negative review. I was just stressed. You know, that kind of thing really helpful within a marketplace. Um, I think the other big thing that can occur too is like you were talking about, Ron, with the sellers. We want to sort of have like this intelligence within where it can at scale automatically in sort of a self-service type of a way. Um, give the sellers feedback when they get reviews. So not just an individual item, but their company, their support and service. And a lot of reviews can be much more helpful if we have certain categories, like um, what was the quality of the product? What was the descriptions and the marketing collateral that they posted to the site? How was shipping? Exactly. How was shipping? Um, what was the timeliness? Um, you also will find very beneficial instead of just a single review. So right. a lot of nuance to this, but ultimately the big thing that we want to encourage you to think about as a uh, user or customizer or, you know, an owner of a marketplace platform is what fidelity makes sense within your space. What are the criteria and then allow you to scale up and, and do it in a self-service and automated fashion. Yeah, one of the things that our platform, too, out of the box, I just kind of wanted to talk briefly about a couple of the features. Um, with our platform, in and read all the reviews. Like, so I'm shopping. I want to see the reviews. So I don't need to be logged in. I don't need to have an account. That's very helpful, right? Ron, helping Ron make it a purchasing decision. However, Ron sees this and goes, oh, yeah, I used to have one. Like, I want to leave a review. Well, if I go down to where it says reviews and click on that, the box, it says log in to leave a review. So first off, one of the things out of the box is know who's leaving with a view. You can do that we can turn on is only if they purchase a product. I don't care if Ron bought that from Best Buy. I'm on Target.com. You can't leave a bad review Target about this product when you bought it from Best Buy. In your Best Buy profile and you bought it, just like when I go and buy something on eBay, right? As soon as I buy something on eBay and I finish, it sends me an email and says, hey, don't forget to leave a review. And I log into my account and under my purchase history, there's a button on that item that I bought to leave the review. So the review is tied specifically to the item that's been purchased. So only the person that bought it, not some bot, not 27 different people all leave in reviews because the whole family's mad and they all want to tank the company, right? Only the person that bought it can review it and review it. We allow them potentially to update their review, but then you have character limits and things like that that we can control. It. So there's a lot of things that you want to look at when you're evaluating to make sure that the platform helps ensure that the rating and reviews have as much integrity as possible. I love Chris always talks about integrity and that's really where it's at. If you can infer, if you can give that integrity, that trust and establish that trust to your buyers, they will come and buy from you. If you can establish that trust with your sellers and with the governance, say you got their back, you're not going to let them have these frivolous reviews, this will sell with you. So truly the success of a marketplace is establishing that trust with all entities that engage that marketplace. And that all comes right down to the platform and both the platform and its implementation, as well as the, as the owner of the platform put in place. So you spoke briefly, and that kind of segues right into the next topic there, Chris. You, you briefly mentioned about the store profile, right? You want to rate the seller. You want to go to their profile and go, hey, I buy from Chris all the time. I want to favorite him. He's one of my favorite stores. Um, and then Chris chastises me, whatever. So I want to leave him a bad review. And then the next time I want to leave him a good review. So how does all that play in? 
the store profile. And that can talk not just rating the store profile, but that could be how do we expose that store profile? When I go to have a favorite sellers tab anywhere, I don't think so. Do you know, like when I go to DoorDash, the very first thing that pops up is save stores, right? The stores that I order from all the time, they're right there. It makes it super, super easy because we're in Texas. It's Chewy's all the way, right? We got to get our creamy jalapeno on. So save store, boom, Chewy's is right there. Same kind of thing on a marketplace. How do you find easily your saved stores? What does that storefront look like? What kind of information do you allow the storefront to put in their profile? Do you to allow them to put their website and their phone number so then they can go outside your marketplace and start dealing directly with them? Ooh, maybe not, right? You have to think through all of these things. Um, and I remember doing that with horse trainers. Remember, we were building that out with dealer and the manufacturer uh, profiles, and we were deciding how much we wanted them to take the business outside the platform. So we weren't allowing email addresses. They had to message through the platform. So they could come back and go, hey, if I buy 10 of these, will you give me a discount? They can't just go email platform and steal your business and not go through the platform, right? So there's a lot of different things like that that you might want to consider. So go ahead and dive in, Chris, to the the seller store profile, right? Uh, Let's go ahead and dive into that a little bit. Absolutely. Thanks, Ron. And yeah, like you said, I mean, I think this is such a huge aspect uh, for a seller, it can be a huge differentiating opportunity because ultimately, like you were talking about earlier with the power sellers in eBay that we turn on that are performance-based that demonstrate their sort of, you know, behavioral-based demonstration that this particular seller, they've sort of met a tier of behavior within the marketplace. And what you said earlier about integrity and governance and that is the backbone of a marketplace is this ability for someone to go in and let their guard down because they know that you're policing it in a reasonable way, uh, but in a firm way. And so ultimately, the store profile can be a showcase for some aspects. Um, another key thing that you know quite often we'll do is have some sort of verification that they are a real business. Uh, maybe it's a you know independent photographers that go and photograph the business and verify its validity. Uh, Maybe they have to have reference customers that they have to view to meet a certain tier of, you know, being a power seller within your place, for example. And then of course, typically, you know, within the store profile, we want to make it very friendly. And again, like we talked about earlier, sort of a simple opinionated experience where they can select from different templates, uh, practices for their particular space. incorporate their branding uh, to the extent that it makes sense within your platform. A lot of our particular sellers, uh, you know, will get the ability to generate their own website. They can be a standalone website that can be a sort of subset of the marketplace that is that seller's items. And this is really powerful too. So, you know, to what extent do you want to offer your sellers this capability? Uh, Maybe it's the ability to embed their store within their social media or within their existing site, they want to embed their catalog. That's another common scenario that we can you know, help provide. So this would all typically be part of that profile. Uh, but of course, on the baseline, we want to be able to allow them to provide their basic information about their business. So logo, um, you know, some of their standard branding, like some of their colors and background and um, imagery of uh, information about the business, possibly information about details within their business. So uh, they, may, they may want to provide, depending on your marketplace, uh, information about fulfillment. Uh, what are their terms for you know, quantity-based purchases? Maybe they're doing um, you know, complex fulfillment, where if it's uh, you know, large real estate transactions that we're conducting through this, uh, how do they handle the terms uh, for having an escrow? And then what happens if you, know, you fall out of escrow and uh, what platforms do they use? And, you know, maybe you have to be an accredited investor to purchase something from this market. Um, how do we go about verifying that? Uh, maybe if it's bulk liquidation, uh, there needs to be some form of proof or deposit that gets. So what are their terms? So a lot of basic logistics can be really helpful within the store profile. Um, and just ultimately, what we want you to know is that the store profile, this, you know, this seller profile, 
it should be really, really adaptable based on what your business needs. And it should be something that really conveys the credibility and has opportunities for sellers to sort of behaviorally prove and validate themselves within the market based on information that's measured outside of them. You know, that it's not biasable by them um, and it's going to reinforce that credibility within the marketplace. And then, like I said, additionally, uh, the ability for them to inject their sort of subset of information into their own site that might be external from your marketplace um, or even route their DNS, their domain information to your site and have their, their basic site be hosted by your marketplace. This can make it so it has a moat around it and becomes absolutely sticky for your sellers. And whenever you can accomplish that, you want to because you're going to build in a lot of SEO benefit by having a bunch of different domains that point to your marketplace. Um, that is going to be massively helpful. Um, and I won't go into all the details here, Ron, but uh, there's a lot of nuance to having external stores and embeddable stores that can be really tactically helpful. Uh, yeah. But suffice to say, you know, does the platform, the marketplace software you're working with have these capabilities? Does it have the flexibility to meet your needs? Um, we really encourage you to think about that specific question. Yeah. And uh, even one of the big marketplaces we did a couple of years ago, this feature alone was actually a point of monetization, right? So a vendor, when you clicked on the seller store, it would have the name of the store. It would have a link that said contact seller. And the contact seller was our marketing messaging platform. So they didn't have the email address. They couldn't post their phone number. But then they also sold, uh, what, what did we call it? Enhanced profiles. I can't remember what we called it. it. It was like an enhanced thing. And then they paid a monthly fee and then it allowed them to include their logo and allowed them to include their URL and, and some other information. Um, and then it's easier for the storefront to say, hey, uh, in my marketplace, right? Um, I remember when I started at Clarity 10 and a half years ago, I was always confused at all these 888 numbers that were being called. And I'm like, what are all these 888 numbers? And you're like, oh, those are different call rail numbers. And we have different numbers that come in through different mechanisms so we can track where the leads are generating and having people call us. So people can have different phone numbers in their profile in your marketplace. So when they call them, that business can track how much business you're sending them, right? And that in turn then decides how much money they want to market, how much they want to advertise with you. So you also have to think about the store profile, not just information about the seller, but also your monetization opportunities if you're selling profiles and selling a business directory. All right. So let's, let's talk about user accounts, roles, permissions, in the marketplace, because there are a lot of different roles in there, right? And I'll just mention a couple of them, and then I'll let you dive in technically to additional roles as well as how to implement and how you can control roles. So there could be multiple tiers within, if it's a very highly targeted B2B marketplace, there could be multiple roles within a buyer. For example, Clarity may sign up as a buyer, but Chris, you sign up as the admin of the account and you have to approve purchases of over $500. And then you can approve certain employees that can buy up to $500. And then it has to go to you. You might even create a role for the CFO who has to pay the invoices on the account, but they don't get to make purchases. I mean, there are all kinds of different roles, even within just, quote unquote, a buyer account, right? And usually when we expose something like that, we usually have a tab called user management. And so the primary user goes into their user management and who has access and who has what roles within their organization with regards to purchasing. Then obviously, when you go to other marketplaces, there might be different roles within the administration of the markets. Then there might be also different roles within the administration of the seller. Seller who can go in and modify the profile and their contact information versus who can just go in and manage the orders because they're pick and packing everything and doing the dropship. Uh, so there can be a number of different roles. Those roles could be scope based on features and functionalities within each of the areas of the marketplace, buying versus for fulfillment for the supplier versus aggregate management, reporting, um, advertising. There's a whole bunch of different areas. So go ahead and dive in as deep as you want to go. I just wanted to introduce the fact that there's a lot of different areas here where we could have a lot of different types of accounts and role and scope access. Yeah, absolutely. This, this one is also one that depending on your scenario, 
Um, it may be quite a deep topic. And so I'll just want to note that that is possible. And the examples you gave, Ron, are excellent. And fundamentally, what we want you to be thinking about, encourage you to be thinking about as you know, a marketplace owner, marketplace manager, a steward of these relationships that are going to occur is what are the different personas? Like you said, Ron, what are the different personas and what are the, all of the edge cases that could occur? And there are a lot of them typically, but the other thing is, you know, how much fidelity do we want to sort of risk? And I want to emphasize this risk overwhelming the users with a lot of users really need you and your partner that you're working with, your software partner, to have a strong opinion so that they can get on with their day while accomplishing exactly what they want and need without any extra overhead. <laughs> now, this is easy to talk about, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it is non-trivial. And that's why it really makes sense to work with a partner who has a lot of experience. But this, this really is something that you can even adapt to analytics-wise. You can look at the data and look at the feedback that you get and adapt in real time to what you present as options for users. But ultimately, the big question is, you know, what makes sense in your space? Uh, different niches, as we've seen many, many times, um, different niche offerings and you know, categories have different needs for what level of detail makes sense to present for the roles. And you know, if, if we're allowing sellers to manage users within their account, um, what exactly is the process for them to get someone go? It's to be easy for them to do to initially set someone up. And then what is the process for them to get in and modify their, their roles and their access and make it clear to them what exactly they're modifying and how it works without a lot of complex interaction? Okay, so that's absolutely critical. The other thing that we'll just say in general here is that the fidelity of control that you have within your marketplace can be really frustrating if it isn't enough fidelity that you can modify for control. And let me just give an example of this. Um, a lot of sellers will have users within their organization that they want to have access to see data that might be in a specific report, but they just don't want them to see these two fields within that report. But they don't want to have to make a new report that's literally a brand new report just to be able to restrict access to these two fields of data with this report that's, you know, a really complex report. Um, they need to be able to discreetly identify that this user should not be able to see these two fields and can the platform update dynamically to do that. Um, another example would be fields within the user interface. Can it dynamically not show or make the fields read only or uh, trigger a workflow for approval for certain fields or entities. And these are really key aspects from sort of a technical perspective because if your marketplace platform sort of does the basic things that you need right now, and then two years from now, you've scaled up, you're massively increasing your marketing budget, uh, you're getting you know, a lot of results from different events that ever the logistics are, uh, but you're really scaling up, then you sort of realize that you're painted into a corner because your platform doesn't have enough fidelity to control things that users are looking for, uh, then you're sort of, yeah, like I said, painted into a corner. So you want to think ahead and ask these questions about, is this platform going to give me this fidelity of control over these areas? And I would say it, it really helps to think about edge cases and nuances uh, that are going to come up three to five years from now. Um, and this is just an absolutely critical area to ask that question on. Uh, the other thing that I would say is security in general. Um, now, this is something that we'll get into more as well as we dig into the next topics here. But whenever you're looking at security, depending on your platform and just in general as a rule nowadays, <clears throat> you really want to put yourself into a position where you're looking for um, opportunities where your system may have security issues and how we can set up multi-factor authentication or more robust authorization or approval or something happens. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, we really don't want the default starting place for all users that a seller would create within their organization to have the ability to go spend tens of thousands of dollars with a stored credit card on their advertising. That would probably not be a good thing. Um, so what's the approval process for your users and what kind of information do you present to your administrators so they understand like, hey, 
you are giving this user the keys to the kingdom. And here are some of the things that they can do. do you accept and do you understand, <laughs> you know, right. um, and that that's also something for the buyers too. depending on how sophisticated you want your buyer accounts to be. Uh, you may have several roles within buyer accounts so that you can have a, you know, purchaser, uh, purchasing manager. Uh, then you might have a approver, a uh, purchase approver. Uh, then you might have a finance team member. You may have another team member who's going to be running all of the tax documents quarterly and annually. You know, these are the types of things that are going to be necessary at scale. And so again, within the buyer side of things, what levels of checks and balances and workflows are you going to enable? And how will this tie in with your roles and permissions um, and account structures? Things to think about. Again, we don't want to go into all of the extreme detail, although I do like to go into some so you can get a flavor of it. Yeah. Um, there's just a lot of depth here that you can get into, right? Yeah. And it might not even be just technical, right? Because a lot of times when you think uh, accounts and permissions and roles, we're always thinking about access, right? But what about guidance? What does that mean? Well, for example, think about Amazon as a buyer. What does it do? Well, when I click on orders, I have one button that says see all orders. They try to make it so easy for me to reorder again, right? They try to make it so easy for me to find my orders and track my orders because that's the guidance they want. However, if I'm a seller on Amazon, when I go in, they want to see all my orders, but they want to see the dollar amount. They want to see the trending amount. They want to see how much money is being spent over time. So they're showing me a report that's got this bar curve going up and to the right, and I'm making more money and more money and more money. So I'll sell more with them, right? Can you imagine if they showed a buyer that report and I went and saw that me and my wife spent $500 last month and then $1,000 this month, and we're already spending $1,500 already in the first two weeks of this month, if they showed me that report and showed my spending, that would have the exact opposite effect on me that it would on a seller, right? So even with the role and access and the information that we're talking about, it's not just access. It's you want to ensure that you're sharing the right information to help the right behaviors on the website. Knowledge is power. What does that empower? Well, it empowers sellers to earn and make more money if you're showing them that they're earning and making more money or you're showing they're going down and giving them guidance on how to reverse that trend and make more money. The user, on the other hand, you're not showing them how much they spent. You're showing them all of the orders. You're making it easy to track their orders. You're making it easier to reorder, to remind, to find things that have been out of stock and remind them. Uh, to remind them they have abandoned a cart and they had something in the cart that they didn't buy and don't forget and lose out on this, uh, that this item that you had on your watch list just went on sale, hurry and pick it up now. You have three weeks to get it before Christmas, things like that, right? So when you start talking about data and information and dynamically serving that up, it's not only about access, it's how do you use that data to guide specific behaviors? All right, so time check. Do you want to go into GDPR privacy compliance? Do you want to call it for today? I don't know what your schedule looks like. Let's call it. My okay. body is... Yeah, thanks, man. I'm going to go yep. get some caffeine. <laughs>